So welcome everyone to Bocacino Live. This is the sixth event that we've done. Can't believe it. Um, it's Wednesday, November 11th, and we're looking forward to sharing books that are coming out in the next couple of weeks through January 5th. We're not gonna be doing one of these events in December. We figure everybody's got a lot going on in December. So this is the last event of this year for Bocacino Live. We have some other things coming up that we'll tell you about. And uh, we'll be picking up in January. So today we'll be through January 5th, and we'll also be doing some books that are coming out in February that we're excited about. Okay, so with no further ado, First of all, I want to share what your top picks were from last month, because, you know, at the end of this event, what we do is we have a survey that's available to you. Anybody who attends live is eligible to answer the survey, and they will then share what their favorite books were. So these were your four top picks from last month. The Mystery of Mrs. Christie by Marie Benedict, which is out on December 29th. Girl in the Mirror by Rose Carlyle. Lisa Jewell's Invisible Girl, and White Ivy from Susie Yang. These are the ones you're most looking forward to reading, and we're looking forward to seeing what you've got, that you'll be interested in for next month. So we're gonna start with fiction, as always, and first book is The Arrest by Jonathan Lethem. It's on sale this week. The Arrest isn't post-apocalypse, it isn't dystopia, it isn't utopia. It's just when, uh, when much, much of what we take for granted Cars, guns, computers, and airplanes, for starters, stop working. Before the arrest, Sandy Duplessis had a reasonably good life as a screenwriter in LA. An old college friend and writing partner, the charismatic and malicious Peter Toddbaum had become one of the most powerful men in Hollywood, and that didn't hurt. Now, post-arrest, there's nothing is like it was. Sandy, who calls himself a journeyman, has landed in rural Maine. There he assists the butcher, and delivers food grown by his sister, Maddie, at her organic farm. But then Totem shows up with an extraordinary vehicle, a retrofitted tunnel digger powered by a nuclear reactor. Totem has spent the arrest, smashing his way across a fragmented a United States, trailing enemies all along the way. Popping back into siblings' lives with his usual odious panache, his motives are kind of unclear. Could it be that Totem wants to produce one more extravaganza? Whatever he's up to, it may fall to the journeyman to stop him. So that's the arrest from Jonathan Lethem. Next, we've got Cobble Hill from Cecily Van Zygesar. Um, you may remember her as the author of Gossip Girl. Remember Gossip Girl? Um, welcome to Cobble Hill. In this eclectic Brooklyn neighborhood, private storms brew amongst four married couples and their children. Yes, remember everybody was single before and everyone's married. There's ex-groupie Mandy, so underwhelmed by motherhood and her current physical state that she fakes a debilitating disease to get the attention of her husband, Stuart. There's the unconventional new school nurse, Peaches, on whom Stuart has an unrequited crush, and her disappointing husband, Greg, who wears noise-canceling headphones everywhere. Roy, a newly transplanted British novelist, has lost the thread of his next novel and his marriage to Wendy. So around the corner, Tupper, a nervous, introverted industrial engineer, struggles to pin down his elusive artist wife, Elizabeth. So here you've got the couples of Cobble Hill. You know their lives are all gonna intertwine. And you know what? No one is gonna be social distancing. Nobody's gonna be, this is the way life used to be. So here you've got these four couples all hanging out with one another. Next, we've got Ready Player Two by Ernest Cline. Um, some of these books that I'm including are also, remember this is a great time for thinking about gift giving. And we've got some books on this list that we think are gonna be great gifts to be giving this holiday season. We'd like to remind you that while Amazon's a great place to shop for convenience, we really love supporting indie stores and getting um, indie stores supported because we want them to be there when we, when we need them. So this is one of the books that I've included because I think it could be a good prize, a, a good gift for people on your uh, list as well. It's a highly anticipated sequel to the beloved worldwide bestseller, Ready Player One. Notice, I love the color of this book. Do you think it just is like my color? I think I just have to have this one up on my shelf just because of that. Um, days after winning Oasis founder um, James Halliday's contest, Wade Watts makes a discovery that changes everything. Hidden within Halliday's vaults, waiting for his heir to find, lies a technological advancement that will once again change the world and make Oasis a thousand times more wondrous and addictive than Wade ever dreamed possible. 
With it comes a new riddle, a new quest, a last Easter egg from Halliday, hinting at a mysterious prize and an unexpected, impossibly powerful and dangerous new rival awaits, one who will kill millions to get what he wants. Ready Player Two is another imaginative, fun, action-packed adventure through a beloved virtual universe and jolts us thrillingly into the future once again. And I will tell you that anybody who has anybody in their family who's gaming, gaming is so far up, the numbers on it are so far up during the pandemic, perfect book for the gamer on your list. <clears throat> Next, we're going to go to historical fiction. And first, we've got Dark Tides from Philippa Gregory. This is going to be on sale November 24th. Midsummer Eve, 1670. Two unexpected visitors arrive at a shabby warehouse on the south side of the River, T River Thames. The first is a wealthy man hoping to find the lover he deserted 21 years before. James Avery has everything to offer, and he believes that the warehouse's poor owner, Alinar, has the one thing his money cannot buy, his son and heir. The second visitor is a beautiful widow from Venice in deepest mourning. She claims Alinar as her mother-in-law and has come to tell Alinar that her son, Rob, has drowned in the dark tides of the Venice Lagoon. Eleanor writes to her brother Ned, newly arrived in faraway New England, and trying to make a life between the worlds of the English newcomers and the American Indians they move towards inevitable war. Eleanor tells him what she knows, without doubt, that her son is alive and the widow is an imposter. This is the latest from Philippa Gregory, November 24th. Next, we've got The Arctic Fury by Greer McAllister, which will be on sale on December 1st. Um, I've heard a lot of buzz happening about this book. Here is, it's based on the true story of an expedition that really I did not know anything about. A dozen women join a secret 1850s Arctic expedition and a sensational murder trial unfolds when some of them don't come back. Eccentric Lady Jane Franklin makes an outlandish offer to adventurer Virginia Reeve. Take a dozen women, trek into the Arctic, and find her husband's lost expedition. Four parties have failed to find him, and Lady Franklin wants a radical new approach, put the women in charge. Don't we just love that? Just put the women in charge. A year later, Virginia stands trial for murder. Survivors ex of the expedition willing to publicly support her sit in the front row. There are only five, so what happened down on the ice? You'll have to read The Arctic Fury coming December 1st to find out. Next, we've got The Mystery of Mrs. Christie, and I'm reprising this one here because the last time we spoke about this book, it was way in the future, and now we're a little bit closer with December 29th. It's December 1926, um, Athica Christie goes missing. Investigators find her empty car at the edge of a deep, gloomy pond, the only clues, some tire tracks nearby, and a fur coat left in the car, which is strange to do on a frigid night. Her husband and daughter have no knowledge of her whereabouts, and England unleashes an unprecedented manhunt to find the up-and-coming mystery author. Eleven days later, she reappears, just as mysteriously as she disappeared, claiming amnesia and providing no explanations for her time away, and the puzzle of those eleven days has passed. With her eight trademark exploration into the shadows of history, acclaimed author Marie Benedict brings us into the world of Agatha Christie, imagining why such a brilliant woman would find herself at the center of such a murky story, her own private mystery. So this actually did happen with Agatha Christie. So I think this is a spectacular cover too. I think this cover is just gonna pop on shelves. Next, we've got Our Darkest Night, which is a novel of Italy and the Second World War that is coming from Jennifer Robeson on January 5th. Um, many of you know Jennifer Robeson just because of the, the fabulous historical fiction that, that she's done in the past. Here, it's the autumn of 1943. Life is becoming increasingly perilous for Italian Jews like the Mazin family. With Nazi Germany now occupying most of her beloved homeland and the threat of imprisonment and deportation growing ever more certain, Antonio Mazin has but one hope to survive, to leave Venice and her beloved parents and hide in the countryside with a man she has only just met. Nico Girardi was studying for the priesthood until circumstances forced him to leave the seminary and to run his family's farm. 
a moral and just man, he could not stand by when fascists and Nazis began taking innocent lives. Rather than risk a perilous escape across the mountains, Nina will pose as his new bride. And to keep her safe and protect secrets of his own, Nico and Nina must convince prying eyes they are happily married and in love. But farm life is not easy for a cultured city girl who dreams of becoming a doctor like her father. And Nico's provincial relatives are wary of this soft and educated woman they don't know. Even worse, their distrust is shared by a local Nazi officer with a vendetta against Nico. The more he learns of Nina, the more his suspicions grow, and with them, his determination to exact revenge. When I was reading about this and I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, Mark Sullivan's book, Beneath the Scarlet Sky, which was also set in Italy. So this is another take on what happened in Italy during the war. Next, we've got thrillers and mysteries, because we know you love those. Um, first up, we've got Yo Nesbo's The Kingdom, uh, which is on sale this week. Roy has never left the quiet mountain town he grew up in, unlike his little brother, Carl, who couldn't wait to get out and escape his troubled past. But Carl has big plans for his hometown. And when he returns with mysterious new wife and a business opportunity that seems too good to be true, simmering tensions begin to surface and unexplained deaths in the town's past come under new scrutiny. Soon, power players set their sights on taking the brothers down by exposing their role in the town's sordid history. As the body count rises, Roy's loyalty to family is tested, and then he finds himself inextricably drawn to Carl's wife, Shannon, an attraction that will have devastating consequences. Next, we've got The Law of Innocence, a Lincoln lawyer novel that's coming from Michael Connolly. On the night he celebrates a big win, defense in attorney Mickey Haller is pulled over by the police who find the body of a former client in the trunk of his Lincoln. Seriously. He is immediately charged with murder, but can't post the exorbitant $5 million bond slapped on him by a vindictive judge. Haller elects to represent himself and is forced to mount his defense from his jail cell in the Twin Towers Correctional Center in downtown Los Angeles. He knows he's been framed, whether by a new enemy or an old one. As his trusted team, including his half-brother Harry Bosch, investigates, Howard must use all his skills in the courtroom to counter the damning evidence against him. And anybody who's ever watched Bosch on um, uh, the Amazon Prime, the Bosch series on Amazon Prime, now you can picture LA a whole different way. You can see what the correctional uh, center looks like. You can visualize what all this is in a new different way. Next, we've got Little Cruelties by Liz Nugent. It's out this week. Um, I read this over, finished this over the weekend, and it is just so very, very well done. It's going to be a book reporter bets on selection. I just didn't have time to put the tag up on it there. All three of the Drum Brothers were at a funeral at the start of this book, but only one of them is in the coffin. And for the rest of the book, you're trying to figure out who that was. William, Brian, and Luke, three boys born a year apart, trained from birth by their wily mother to compete for her attention. They play games as brothers do, yet even after the drums escape into the world beyond their windows, those games, those little cruelties, grow more sinister, more merciless, and more dangerous. And with their lives intertwined like strands of a noose, only two of the brothers will survive. And I will tell you that this book flips back and forth about what these brothers do to each other. You're going to go through this trying to figure out who's the good brother and the way their lives intertwine with women, their careers, their lives, their relationship with their mother, just everything bounds up to be many little cruelties. Also, I like the cover on this because it's got the plate um, where we've got two sections that are kind of split in half and then there's something broken off at the bottom. I think it really evokes the brother who's died at the end. Um, I'm hoping to interview Liz. I'm going to try and see if I can set that up. She's in the UK, which is a big best-selling author in the UK. Next, we've got Moonflower Murders from Anthony Horowitz. Um, retired publisher Susan Ryland is running a small hotel on a Greek island. The Trahines come to stay and tell a story about a murder that took place on the same day in the same hotel in which their daughter was married, which fascinates Susan and piques her editor's instincts. One of her former writers, the late Alan Conway, author of the fictional Magpie Murders, knew the murder victim 
an advertising executive named Frank Paris and based the third book in his detective series on that very crime. The Treham's daughter, Cecile, Cecily, believes that the book proves the man convicted of Paris's murder is innocent. When the Trahines reveal that Cecily is now missing, Susan knows that she must find out what really happened. So we've got Moonflower Murders from Anthony Horowitz. Next, we've got Peace of My Heart by Mary Higgins Clark and Alla Fair Burke. As most of you know, Mary Higgins Clark passed away recently. I believe this is their last book together. Peace of My Heart, remember whenever Mary was titling books, she liked to paste them on songs, so another piece of my heart. So this is coming on November 17th. In it, television producer Lori Moran and her fiance, Alex Buckley, the former host of her investigative television series, are just days away from their mid-August wedding when things take a dark turn. Alex's seven-year-old nephew, Johnny, vanishes on the beach. A search party begins and witnesses recall Johnny playing in the water, collecting shells behind the beach shack, but no one remembers seeing him after the morning. As the sun sets, Jimmy, Johnny's skimboard washes up to shore and everyone realizes he could be anywhere, even under the water. There's a ticking clock, a sinister stalker, and fresh romance combine in this exhilarating follow-up to the best-selling You Don't Own Me, another riveting page turner from the Queen of Suspense, Mary Higgins Clark, and her dazzling partner in crime, Alla Fair Burke. So there you've got Peace of My Heart, November 17th. Next, we've got Alla Clare... Alla Alexander McCall Smith is back with How to Raise an Elephant. This is out on November 24th, the new book in the perennial adorable number one ladies detective agency series. I remember seeing this was adapted for television or movie or something and I watched the series and it was just so much fun. Um, this one sees precious um, Ramazzo uh, calling upon her maternal instincts when she's faced with a two ton case. They say it takes a village to raise a child, but can she and the rest of the number one lady detective agency come together to raise a pipsqueak pachyderm? We may find out in this novel, we may not, who can say? And I just love this adorable cover, a little baby elephant. Next, we've got Fool Me Twice by Jeff Lindsay. I think I teased this book, uh, one of the previous presentations, it's coming out on December 1st. Now remember, I think I told you a story last time about um, Jeff being the, uh, the writer of the Dexter series and him coming up to me at a party once and saying, oh, this is going to be on Showtime. They've optioned it and me not believing him. And then it was. I remember I told you the Dexter series ended. Well, the last time we, we I spoke about this, I literally closed my computer and learned that there's going to be another season of Dexter, that they're bringing it back. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like such a liar because the show, show was completely over. So there's going to be some new episodes that are coming up on Showtime. So Fool Me Twice opens in St. Petersburg, where Riley Wolf steals a Fabergé egg, which is no easy task. Betrayed by the pilot he hired to help him get away, he wakes chained to a rock wall on one of the Kerguelen Islands, the most remote spot on Earth, prisoner of a top dog international arms dealer and a top-notch art collector. He wants Riley to steal an artwork. Small problem, it's a fresco. The liberation of St. Peter. Second larger problem, it's in the Vatican. Riley has no choice, agree or die. But when his captor cuts him loose, he's grabbed by another arms dealer looking to do a double cross. Worse, he gives Riley a special incentive. The threat is clear. Riley knows he has only way out. So fool me twice, it's by Jeff Lindsay. Next, we have a book called The Push by Ashley Audrain, which is coming um, January 5th. I just heard this author speak about this book yesterday. It's um, Kristen Hanna gave it a blurb that says it's starkly original and compulsively readable. And after she read it, she got in touch with me and said, have you read The Push yet? And I, of course, I had not. And she says, you must read it. And then after you read it, you have to call me and talk about it. So it's that kind of a book. It's one of the most expected books of 2021. In it, Blythe Connor is determined that she will be the warm, comforting mother to her new baby, Violet, that she never herself had. But in the thick of motherhood's exhausting early days, Blythe becomes convinced that something is wrong with her daughter. She doesn't behave like most children do. Or is it all in Blythe's head? Her husband, Box, says that she's imagining things. 
the more Fox dismisses her fears, the more Blythe begins to question her own sanity, and the more we begin to question what Blythe is telling us about her life as well. Then their son Sam is born, and with him, Blythe has the blissful connection she'd always imagined with her child. Even Violet seems to love her little brother. But when life as they know it changes an instant, the devastating fallout forces Blythe to face the truth. So we've got the push coming. I am looking forward to this. I'm going to try and interview Ashley. She was so compelling to listen to yesterday that I'd like to try to get an interview with her for our readers. Next, we're going to do memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction. And I actually have a lot of these this time because it's, I think it's the time of year that these books are all coming out. Um, and we have some really good ones. Um, first up, we have, this title is perfect, folks. I mean, I'm telling you right now, this is perfect. This time next year, we'll be laughing by Jacqueline Winspear. Now, if we all want this title to definitely be the truth, and let's face it, we really want the dark gate to start with 2021. You know, all the people who are saying, oh no, it really doesn't start in 2020, it starts in 2021. Yes, we wanna go with those people and we wanna think about next year that we'll be laughing. I had the pleasure of interviewing Jackie about this book. It's a book reporter bets on selection, and it's very different. You may know her name because she's the New York Times um, bestselling author of the Maisie Dobbs series. But here, she's offering a deeply personal memoir of her Kentish childhood and her family's resilience in the face of war and privation. She tackles such difficult, poignant, and fascinating uh, family memories as her paternal grandfather's shell shock, her mother's evacuation from London during the Blitz, her soft-spoken animal-loving father's torturous assignment to an explosive team during World War II, her parents' years living with Romani gypsies, and her own childhood working in farms at rural Kent, capturing her ties to the land and her dream of being a writer at its very inception. Did a, such a fun interview with her. So enjoyed talking to her. Um, what is really uh, fun is, see the picture here? That is her at about age three. We talked about this story in the interview. And the reason she's making that face is she's just been stung by a bee on her lip. And what she's carrying in her hands are hops, because even the children on the farm used to go uh, harvest the hops. And that's what she's carrying in her hands as on this cover picture. Story is wonderful. It's really about her life living sort of like off the grid in a lot of ways. And to liken it with this person that I know that's written, I believe it's uh, 15, 13 or 15 novels in the uh, Maisie Dobbs series. Um, just a, it's just a beautifully written story and you feel like you know her so intimately by the time you're done reading this book. Next, year, next we've got We Keep the Dead Close, A Murder at Harvard and a Half Century of Silence by Becky Cooper, which is out this week. Um, this book is getting a lot of media attention. I know I spoke about it in an earlier preview, but I wanted to make sure it's on your radar because it's out now. It's uh, 1969, it's the height of the counterculture and the years where universities would seek to curb the unruly spectacle of student protests. The winter that Harvard would begin the tumultuous process of merging with Radcliffe, it's all female sister school. And the year that Jane Britton, an ambitious 23 year old graduate student in Harvard's anthropology department and the daughter of Radcliffe Vice President J. Boyd Britton would be found bludgeoned to death in her Cambridge, Massachusetts apartment. 40 years later, Becky Cooper, a curious undergrad, would hear the first whispers of the story. In the first telling, the body was nameless. The story was this. A Harvard student had an affair with her professor and the professor had her murdered in the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology because she threatened to talk about the affair. Though the rumors proved false, the story that unfolds, one that Cooper will follow up for 10 years is even more complex. A tale of gender inequality in academia, a cowboy culture among empowered male elites, the silencing effect of institutions and our compulsion to rewrite the stories of female victims. It's really interesting as I know people have gone to Harvard and this story was whispered about for years of what really, really happened behind the scenes. Well, how did this woman really die? Who was this woman? So Becky Cooper, I really wanna um, read more about how she actually did her research because I think that there's so much that can happen these days that we can learn that there were not the tools and technology available for before. Next, we've got HRH, So Many Thoughts on Royal Style by Elizabeth Holmes. This is on sale on November 17th. Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle are global style icons. They're every fashion choice chronicled and celebrated. 
with all eyes on them, the duchesses select clothes that send a message about their values, interests, and priorities. Their thoughtful sartorial strategies follow the steps of Queen Elizabeth and Diana, Princess of Wales, two towering figures each known for using their personal style to great acclaim. With one section devoted to each woman, HRH is a celebration of their stories and their style, pairing hundreds of gorgeous photographs with extensive research. A picture emerges of the British monarchy's evolution and the power of royal fashion, showing there's always more than what meets the eye. I think I have one friend I know in the audience today, and I know this is going to be a book that she wants to read. I bet this is going to be a big gift book as well. Next, we've got No Time Like the Present. Hold on one second. No Time Like the Future, An Optimist Considers Mortality by Michael J. Fox. And this is going to be in stores on November 17th. In No Time Like the Future, actor and advocate Michael J. Fox shares personal stories and observations about illness and health, the strength of family and friends, and how our perceptions about time affect the way we approach mortality. Thoughtful and moving, but with Fox's trademark sense of humor, this book provides a vehicle for reflection about our lives, our loves, and our losses. Running through the narrative is the drama of the medical madness Fox recently experienced, which included his daily negotiations with Parkinson's disease he's had since 1991, and a spinal cord issue that necessitated immediate surgery. His challenge to learn how to walk again only suffered a devastating fall, nearly caused him to ditch his trademark optimism and get out of the lemonade business altogether. So this is a book that's real, it's from the heart, like Michael J. Fox's books have. And as a result, um, I think it's gonna be one that's gonna be great for book club discussions. We're gonna have some more about that in January on readinggroupguides.com, including a discussion guide, but I wanted to have this one on your radar. Next, we've got A Promised Land by Barack Obama. I don't think this book needs any big introduction. It'll be on sale on November 17th. It's the first volume of his presidential memoirs. It's telling the story of his improbable odyssey from a young man searching for his identity to the leader of the free world, describing in strikingly personal detail both his political education and the landmark moments of the first ter term of his historic presidency, a time of dramatic transformation and turmoil. And what this book is gonna do is the first half of the memoir, there's a second half that will be coming. This book is a whopping 700 something pages. So uh, no, it's going to be a big one. And if you're mailing this one as a gift, this is a big gift that you will be sending to people. He's taking readers on a journey from his earlier, earliest political ambition aspirations to the Iowa caucus victory that demonstrated the power of grassroots activism to November 4th, 2008, when he was elected president. And we all know that was a historical moment. Um, like I said, this is the first half. It's interesting because um, if you may not know, here's a little backstory. Printing books in this country is like really tough right now. The printers are all at capacity and to actually be doing a book uh, printing of this size was gonna be something huge. And I understand this book was printed in Germany and is being shipped here because it, um, the, the, the print one would have been so big that it would have like tied up printing presses. So I find it interesting. Also a little aside here, you know, we don't talk politics on the site, but here's a funny moment. A couple of years ago, I was at the Miami book fair. Um, Obama was there. He was talking about one of his earlier books. And he says, I just want you to know, I'm never going to run for president. And I walked out of the room and I turned around to the person next to me and I said, that guy's going to run for president. So just a very funny story, a very funny aside when just at a, a book event and then you sit there and go, wait, this might be something. Next, we've got The Last Days of John Lennon, which is written by James Patterson. Yes, that James Patterson with Casey Sherman and Dave Wedge. It's coming on December 7th just happens to be my birthday on a Tuesday this year. So every time I see a book coming out on the 7th, I'm like, ah, that's the day my birthday is this year. Because um, books always come out on Tuesdays. Um, the Last Days of John Lennon is the amazing story of John Lennon's life um, and career from his earliest days and the first songs up to his last seconds. It tells the story of the most profound rock and roll genius of all time and the consummate nowhere man who took him from all of us. Even as Lennon leaves the Beatles, becoming a solo artist and making life with Yoko Ono in New York City, Mark David Chapman becomes obsessed with murdering his former hero. Chapman is convinced that Lennon has squandered his talent and betrayed fans with messages of hope and peace. He quits his security job in Hawaii, signing out as John Lennon, boards a flight to New York, a handgun, and bullets stowed in his luggage. 
he's never going home again. So I actually did make a mistake there. This book is coming out on Monday, December 7th. James Patterson books always come out on Mondays. So I'm wrong on that. Usually books are out on Tuesday. This is Monday. My birthday is Monday, December 7th. Clarification. Um, I think I told you in the, um, earlier, so everybody who's with us before, new people might not have heard this story. Um, years ago when I was working at Mademoiselle Magazine, I was working with a young woman who was from Wyoming. She took me out for my birthday, the night after my birthday at a place uptown that sold, um, it was called, um, I think it was the Wyoming Burgers or something like that. I can't remember the name of it. I can't remember the exact name. And walking back, we were walking past the Dakota. And we were walking past and I said to her, that is where really famous people live, including John Lennon, and I'm naming a whole bunch of other celebrities that have lived there through the years, get home that night, and I turn on the news and I hear that John Lennon has died. And he was shot outside the Dakota. And I'm just saying they're like, wait a second, this was like happening, like were we there, like right before this happened or whatever? The timing was very super close and it was even more scary that we heard that he was, um, Chapman was lurking outside the property for hours. So there's a really good chance that we cross paths with him. So there's, you got my personal anecdote about the last days of John Lennon. And now we know that Monday is December 7th, Tuesday is December 8th. Okay. Now we've got some books that are now or soon to be in paperback. And we're including these because there are not a lot of books that come out in November and December. So we want to give you some paperbacks that we know that we were excited about. Some of them kind of got missed during the pandemic. So we want to make sure they're on your radar. First one is Elizabeth Strout's Olive Again. Um, and yes, this is a follow-up to the Pulitzer Prize winning um, her olive book. So here we've got prickly, wry, and resistant to change, yet ruthlessly honest and deeply em empathetic. Olive Kitteridge struggles to understand not only herself and her own life, but the lives of those around her in the town of Crosby, Maine. Whether with a teenager coming to terms with the loss of her father, a young woman about to give birth during a hilarious, inopportune moment, a nurse who confesses a secret high school crush, or a lawyer who struggles with an inheritance she does not want to accept. The unforgettable olive will continue to startle us, move us, and inspire us, in Strout's words, to bear the burden of mystery with as much grace as we can. So there we've got Olive again from Elizabeth Strout. Next we've got When Time Stopped, A Memoir of My Father's War and What Remains by Ariana Newman on sale now. This is a book that um, came out, oh, the timing was just not so great. I want to say it was like February. And I just don't think it got as much attention as it should have gotten. Of the 34 Newman family members, 25 were murdered by the Nazis. One of the survivors was Hans Newman, who traveled to Berlin and hid in plain sight under the Gestapo's eyes. What Hans experienced was so unspeakable that when he built an industrial empire in Venezuela, he couldn't bring himself to talk about it. All his daughter Ariana knew that was something terrible had happened. When Hans died, he left Ariana a small box with letters, diary entries, and other memorabilia. 10 years later, Ariana finally summoned the courage to have the letters translated, and she began reading. What she discovered launched her on a worldwide search that would deliver indelible portraits of a family loving, finding meaning, and trying to survive among the worst that can be imagined. Melanie, who enters, um, edits Word of Mouth, had read this book, and she just said she thought it was absolutely wonderful. One of the reasons I'm putting it up here today. And was also, um, I got to meet Ariana um, at a luncheon back in old days, and she talked about how she had found just this little tiny piece of paper that said that her father was um, German. And she um, found this in German and Jewish. And she goes, dad, were we? And he just took that piece of paper and like hid it away. And she was like a little detective trying to always find clues of what was going on. She knew there was a pervasive sadness in her house and she couldn't figure out why that was happening. What had happened you know, through the years? And when she, her father passes away and she starts to find this journey, she realizes what was going on with her father was so sad all those years and what she had as a takeaway from it. So there we've got What Time Stopped by Ariana Newman. Now we've got Nanaville Adventures in Grandparenting by Anna Quinlan. This was a bets on selection um, when I first read it last year. 
Before blogs existed, Anna Quinlan became a go-to writer on the joys and challenges of family, motherhood, and modern life. In her nationally syndicated column now, she's taking, oh, now she's taking the next step and going full Nana in the pages of this lively, beautiful, and moving book about being a grandmother. Quinlan offers thoughtful and telling observations about her new role, no longer mother and decision maker, but secondary character and support to the parents of her grandson. She writes, where I once led, I have learned to follow. Even a, eventually a close friend provides the words to live by. Did they ask you? And she brings those words up when her grandson is going off to um, kindergarten and she has all these opinions about it and they're not really listening to her and her friend goes, but did they ask you? So here she is talking about a new role. I think that as my friends become grandparents, this is the book I'm gonna give them because there's lots of wit and lots of wisdom in this one. Great gift to give. Um, next we've got Tell Me a Story, My Life with Pat Conroy by Cassandra King Conroy, his wife. Cassandra King was leading a quiet life as a professor, divorced Sunday wife of a preacher, and debut novelist when she met Pat Conroy. Their friendship bloomed into a tentative, long-distance relationship. Pat and Cassandra ultimately married, partly because Pat hated the commute from coastal South Carolina to her native Alabama. It was a union that would last 18 years until the beloved literary icon's death from pancreatic cancer in 2016. In Tell Me a Story, the woman he called King Ray looks back at her love affair with a natural born storyteller whose love for li lust for life was fueled by a fashion, passion for literature, food, and the Carolina low country that was his home. And I have saw Cassandra since um, it, uh, Pat's passing and is still such a big, big empty hole in her life. And I think that her sharing of these stories in this book about him has been as good for her as it is for all of us reading it. Next, we've got um, Tanisi Coates, The Water Dancer. Um, in, this is coming on November 17th. In it, young Hiram Walker was uh, born into bondage. When his mother was sold away, Hiram was robbed of all memory of her, but was gifted with a mysterious power. Years later, when Hiram almost drowns in a river, that same power saves his life. This brush with death births an urgency in him and a daring scheme to escape from the only home he's ever known. So he begins an unexpected journey that takes him from the corrupt grandeur of Virginia's proud plantations to desperate guerrilla cells in the wilderness, from the coffin of the deep south to dangerously ideal, idealistic movements in the north. Even as he's enlisted in the underground war between slavers and the enslaved, Hiram's resolve to rescue the family he left behind endures. It's the Water Dancer on November 17th. And We've got Long Bright River coming from Liz Moore on December 1st. I had the pleasure of interviewing Liz earlier this year, and also this is a book reporter bets on selection. In a Philadelphia neighborhood rocked by the opioid crisis, two once inseparable sisters find themselves at odds. One, Casey, lives on the streets in the vice of addiction. The other, Mickey, walks those same blocks on her police beat. They don't speak anymore, but Mickey never stops worrying about her sister. Then Casey disappears suddenly. At the same time, the mysterious string of murders begins in Mickey's district, and Mickey becomes dangerously obsessed with finding the culprit and her sister before it's too late. It alternates present day mystery with the stories of the sisters' childhood and adolescence. It is so very, very, very well done. Um, I highly uh, recommend reading this book. It'd be a great book for book clubs to sit and discuss. And also, it's really interesting. Long Bright River comes from um, when people uh, shoot up heroin, there's a, a red line of blood. And that is what she was using as her metaphor when she was writing the title for this book. Next, we've got The Arrangement, which is coming from Robin Harding on December 8th. Um, Natalie, a young art student in New York City, is struggling to pay her bills when a friend makes a suggestion. Why not go online and find a sugar daddy, a wealthy older man who will pay for dates and even give her a monthly allowance? Lots of girls do it, Nat learns. Well, all this required is to look pretty and hang on his every word. Sexual favors are optional. Through, but though uh, more than 30 years her senior, Gabe, a handsome corporate finance attorney, seems like the perfect candidate and within a month, they're madly in love. At least Nat is. Gabe already has a family whom he has no intention of leaving. So when he abruptly ends things, Nat can't let go. But Gabe's not about to let his sugar baby destroy his perfect life. 
what was supposed to be a mutually beneficial arrangement devolves a, into a nightmare of deception, obsession, and when a body is found near Gabe's posh Upper East Side apartment, murder. So got a lot of tangled twists here. This is going to be one of our holiday cheer titles, as is um, Little Cruelties. I can't remember which others. Um, that uh, we will be starting on the site on Friday with dedicated newsletters going out in November and December. Next, we've got The Dutch House by Ann Patchett, which is going on sale in paperback on January 5th, the end of the Second World War. Um, Cyril Conroy combines luck and a single canny investment to begin an enormous real estate empire, propelling his family from poverty to enormous wealth. His first order of business is to buy the Dutch House, a lavish estate in the suburbs outside Philadelphia. Meant as a surprise to his wife, the house sets in motion the undoing of everyone he loves. The story is told by Cyril's son, Danny, as he and his older sister, the brilliantly acerbic and self-assured Maeve, are exiled from the house where they grew up by their stepmother. Two wealthy siblings are thrown back into poverty. Their parents have escaped, and they find that they have to count on one another. This unshakable bond between them both saves their lives and thwarts their futures. So that's on sale January 5th. Got some February titles to look forward to, looking ahead. First is one of the most eagerly anticipated books of 2021 by Kristen Hanna. It's The Four Winds. Had the pleasure of reading this. It's absolutely wonderful. It will be a bets on selection. Um, I'm planning to interview Kristen. There are lots of exciting plans coming for this book. Um, you know her as the number one New York Times bestselling author of The Nightingale and The Great Alone. This is an epic novel of love and heroism and hope set against the backdrop of one of America's most defining eras, the Great Depression. It's Texas, it's 1934, millions are out of work, and a drought has broken the Great Plains. Farmers are fighting to keep their land and their livelihoods as crops are failing. The water is drying up and dust threatens to bury them all. One of the darkest periods of the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl era has arrived with a vengeance. In this uncertain and dangerous time, Elsa Martinelli, like many of her neighbors, must make an agonizing choice. Fight for the land she loves or go west to California in search of a better life. The Four Winds is an indelible portrait of America, the American dream, as seen through the eyes of one indomitable woman whose courage and sacrifice will come to define a generation. It's really interesting is Kristen said that when she was writing this book and the time frame of it, she had no idea that what would be going on for us at this time, how the people would be, you know, so far apart from those that they loved. People would be going through great hardship. And as a result, this book is to her um, talking about how people do come through moments of great, uh, great trial and as they do, how they emerge and what happens to them from there. So the Four Winds will be in stores on February 2nd. Next, we've got the Paris Library, coming from, coming from Janet Skyslin um, Charles. This book was originally supposed to come out last May, and they held it due to the pandemic, and I'm glad they did, because it's a book that should be getting some great attention, and it might have gotten lost. It's based on the true World War II story of the heroic librarians at the American Library in Paris. It's an unforgettable story of romance, friendship, family, and the power of literature to bring us together. And it's perfect for fans of Lilac Girls and The Paris Wife. In Paris, 1939, young and ambitious Odie um, Sochet has it all. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Odile Sochet has it all. Her handsome police officer beau and a dream job at the American Library in Paris. When the Nazis march into Paris, Odile stands to lose everything she holds dear, including her beloved library. Together with her fellow librarians, she joins the resistance with the best weapon she has, books. But when the war finally ends, instead of freedom, she tastes the bitter sting of an unspeakable betrayal. Flash to Montana, 19, 1983. Lily is a lonely teenager looking for adventure in small town Montana. Her interest is piqued by her solitary elderly neighbor. As Lily uncovers more about her neighbor's mysterious past, she finds that they share a love of language, the same longings, and the same intense jealousy, never suspecting that a dark secret from the past connects them. It's a Paris Library coming on February 2nd as well. Next, we've got The Survivors by Jane Harper, also coming on February 2nd. 
Kieran Elliott's life changed forever on the day a reckless mistake led to devastating consequences. The guilt that still haunts him resurfaces during a visit with his young family to the small coastal community he once called home. Kieran's parents are struggling in a town where fortunes are forged by the sea. Between them all is his absent brother, Finn. When a body is discovered on the beach, long-held secrets threaten to emerge. A sudden wreckage, a sudden wreck, a missing girl, and questions that have never washed away. That's the Harper, um, the Survivor by Jane Harper, coming February 2nd. And from John Hart, we've got The Unwilling. This is another book that was held over. So if you, I'm saying this because if you see places that was listed as May last year or April or whatever, just know that these books were held. And that's the reason you may be seeing those, those dates coming up. Also coming February 2nd, um, Gibby's older brothers have already been to war. One died there. One came back misunderstood and hard. A decorated killer, now fresh released from a three-year stint in prison. Jason won't speak of the war or of his time behind bars, but he wants a relationship with the younger brother he hasn't known for years. Determined to make that connection, he coaxes uh, Gibby into a day at the lake, long hours of sunshine, whiskey, and older women. But the day turns ugly when the four encounter a prison transfer bus on a stretch of empty road. Beautiful but drunk, one of the women taunts the prisoners, leading to a riot on the bus. The woman finds it funny in the moment, but is savagely murdered soon after. Given his violent history, suspicion first turns to Jason, but when a second woman is kidnapped, the police suspect Gibby too. Determined to prove Jason innocent, Gibby must avoid the cops and dive deeper into his brother's hidden life, a dark world of heroin, guns, and outlaw motorcycle gangs. What he discovers there is truth more disturbing than he ever could have imagined. There's the unwilling from John Hart. Also, um, we have my most recent Vets on Selections, just in case you missed these. Um, Lisa Unger's Confessions on the 745, The Girl in the Mirror by Rose Carlisle, Good Night Beautiful by Amy Malloy, Lisa um, Jewell's Invisible Girl, and next, uh, this time next year, um, We'll Be Laughing. Remember, we want to be laughing next year by Jacqueline Winspear. I actually have interviews with all of these authors. Um, Book Reporter Talks to interviews. Um, if you could be sharing Book Reporter Talks to, we do them both on YouTube and the podcast, as you know, with your friends, with people you see over the holidays. We would so appreciate it because the more that what we're doing gets out and gets known, the more people we have listening and more opportunity is for us to A, get more interviews and B, bring more programming to you. Um, also, my big end of the year contest, our big end of the year contest will be kicking off on Friday, December 4th. It's a contest where I talk about all of my bets on selections. Um, there are 42 of them as of now, and I may stick with 42 or I may do a little bit more. So um, that contest will um, kick off on Friday, December 4th. If I could once again share that with as many people as possible. It's our big contest. Somebody will win or 42 of the books, and then we'll break down the, the titles and um, others will win um, short, smaller collections of the books as well. It'll be seven will win six or six will win seven. We will figure it out. That's math for us guys. It's like really big deals. Um, I want to thank everybody for being with us for this event. Like I said, we just have the one event left next year, then we'll see you next year. So I wish you a happy Thanksgiving, whatever holiday you're celebrating in December. Happy New Year. Just remember 2021, I promise. Remember, Jackie Winspear is telling us we're going to be laughing next year. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>